Welcome once again to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name Podcast. I am Dawson Adebayo, here in London, and he is... Uh, well, you are. Let's let's stick with you for a minute. Another year older and deeper in debt. Happy birthday to you, mate. <laughs> yeah, definitely a year older. Um, yeah, the debt. You'll have to speak to my missus <laughs> about that one, mate. Uh, I'm indebted to her for my life, as it were. But oh. thank you. Yeah. Oh, that was, well, that was smooth. Smooth, that was wasn't smooth. it? Yeah, yeah, I try. I try. Uh, but thank you. You're the real smoothie because you've dressed up for my birthday, I see, again. Well, well, yeah, I've dressed up partly for your birthday <laughs> and partly because this is a replica of the shirt that Roger Daltrey wore in the video of Substitutes. Now, the issue of Substitutes, I think, is pertinent yes. for yeah. the game that we are going to look at today. We are going all the way back to the 14th of June, 1970, a, very, a day very significant in the life of one of the likely lads uh, and uh, significant in the life of both England and West Germany because it is that famous World Cup quarterfinal when we had them by der balls and we let them go. And we have a very special guest to talk about this. Uh, a choice that we've made to talk about this game is obviously inspired by the loss of, of, of the great Gerd Muller. Um, but I don't, think we, I don't think we could have a better guest than someone with a foot in both camps. Oh. Someone who manages to straddle England and Germany, and is writing a book about the football rivalry between these two uh, th these two great nations. Please, could you introduce yourself, Herr Mr. Alexander Gross? <laughs> Herr Gross, danke. <laughs> Uh, yes, I thank can you do for having that. me. I can do Danke. You know, it's not like you've learned German yet, is it? <laughs> <laughs> thank you for having me on and uh, happy birthday, Dotton. I didn't know that until moments ago, but what a splendid occasion. Oh, um, yes, so uh, I'm writing a book called Over the Line. Uh, we haven't decided yet whether it will have a question mark. <laughs> <laughs> it might do Surely uh, it should have a question mark in German and no question mark in England <laughs> yes. it's called Over the Line A History of the England-Germany Football Rivalry and it'll be out next year and um, as Tim has indicated I was born in Germany I have a German father, English mother in prepping for this today and just seeing that date again the 14th of June 1970 something went some went, some spark went off in my mind and I asked my mum to remind me. She actually left England for Germany the following day on 15th of June, 1970. Oh, and uh, five or six days into her stay, she met my father. Uh, so that was the 20th of June. And then uh, having intended to stay for a year, she ended up staying more than 30 years. <laughs> And uh, I was born there. And then when I was nine years old, we all came over to London uh, as a family. That's why I sound like this, uh, but I still speak German. And um, yeah, suffice to say, I find the pronoun we quite problematic when talking about these matches. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I'll be avoiding that. <laughs> which, which would you say is your mother tongue? Uh, so there's a few ways to look at that, isn't there? My mother is mm. English, so strictly in a literal sense uh, English but my first language was certainly German I didn't speak English until I came over here age nine but my parents put me in a English school where none of the pupils and none of the teachers spoke any German so I just had to get on with it and uh, well not even the German teacher there wasn't one <laughs> So, uh, so nowadays, definitely English. All my work, all my um, studies, they're all in English. So, but, but, it, it really does make you the ideal person, doesn't it? I hope to so. To straddle <laughs> the rivalry between these two countries, because I hope so. you you can you you can delve into the the prejudices and yeah. From, from I mean, it's, from both it's something sides. that's it's something that's defined my life. Um, I don't know, you, you probably don't know, but I study um, Shakespeare and literature first and foremost. Don't, so, don't start him, don't start him off. I've exactly. got to watch my P's and Q's. <laughs> now I've been I, bluffing it for years. But I, I, I loved your episode today. about Othello. I love that. Uh, <laughs> linking Shakespeare to football. Oh, but anyway, um, fo 
football is is always a side uh, passion for me. I'm not a football writer first and foremost, but this rivalry really has def- defined my life along uh, many points along the way. Uh, there's been a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, <laughs> but also some great moments. Did, so, the, um, did the rivalry start in 1966? By no means, no. Um, what, one of the things I find most interesting is that England and Germany start playing each other in the game of football at the moment that the nations also become rivals. At the end of the 19th century, turn of the century, 1899 is the first international match between them. And it's around that time that 1900, the sort of 15, 20 years running up to the First World War, that the nations, Germany as a new nation, um, become rivals politically. So uh, I find that fascinating, although I'm not saying there's a causative link, but (laughs) I just find it an interesting uh, observation. Gymnastics was the big German sport, wasn't it, originally? Gymnastics? I don't know. I, I, I bow to your superior knowledge, but, no, I, but I have cer- read that. Certainly many sports clubs, many football clubs in um, in Germany are also sports clubs and would include gymnastics, yeah. My grandfather, uh, my German grandfather was a rower. So, but they uh, embrace the game of football. Uh, Absolutely, and, more and more so, yeah. And arguably did something with the ball that we had never done before, uh, more than once. And that's part of the rivalry. Um, you know, this summer, just this year, yes. beating Germany in the semi-final yeah. of the Euros was arguably a bigger it was game. A bit early when it, was, it, was a, it was a little bit earlier. It was a, it was a second round. Last 16, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it was the quarterfinals. It was quarterfinals. Apologies. Last 16. No, last 16. It was a, oh, it was it was a second 16. round. Was it? Oh, okay. Yeah, of course. Oh, time goes. It was Denmark in the semi-final, wasn't <laughs> That's it? it. Yeah, um, well, beating Germany whenever yeah. <laughs> in, in an international tournament yeah. turned out to be as big uh, a I decided deal. To, I decided to write this book just before that happened. So that's added a chapter, fair to say. <laughs> I can imagine, I can imagine. But in 1966, uh, as we all know, there yeah. is a controversy around England beating Germany in the World Cup 4-2. Mm. That must have hurt. Germans. It must have hurt yeah. not just the German people, but I imagine a sense of German football identity as well. Well, uh, to answer your original question, uh, did the rivalry start there? Um, the rivalry, I would say, I wouldn't call it so much of a rivalry at that point because it was so one sided. Germany hadn't mm. beaten England yet. So um, I always hear Tim talking about this trilogy of games, uh, 66. Um, 70 and then 72 and I believe you've covered the other two already on this pod Yeah. and uh, Tim always says that the third one 72 is when I'll use Tim's pronouns but he says the Germans overtake us (laughs) (laughs) and um, I think 66 was a little bit too early for the German team Uh, although they could have won of course on the day it was very close as we all know (laughs) Um, but then in 70, I think the game we're covering today is the game where they pass each other and where they're very evenly matched. Would you agree, Tim? Um, I think England are better. Yeah. Uh, and clearly, I think, had Gordon Banks been fit, I think the result would have been different. It was an England side that just didn't let two goal leads slip. And there's another factor, and th- th- this is a factor that has always astonished. And, it, and the more I think about the look of the game, the more the more it astonishes me. How non-controversial the refereeing was. Yes. Because I mean, England, there, there are the two most blatant penalties that you will mm. see. And I'm usually a non-penalty fella. Yeah. And I haven't got it. I can't find all of the match. I can't. But I no, saw it yet. just just before I left. Uh, I left England. I saw it. Uh, uh, a mate had cable channel with German channels and I watched it. It was just before USA 94 mm-hmm. German TV played the whole match. And there's also right at the, at the end, after Germany have taken the lead, there's a goal that England have ruled out for offside and watching it. I'm thinking, was it? Mm-hmm. What's see, One factor of, of this game is now I've, I've uh, met Alex firstly by chance 
usually on on uh, underground uh, um, <laughs> platforms both in, in Rio in Rio and in London yeah um, but Alex I remember telling me that he was he lived for a while in the south of Brazil hmm. and uh, I remember you, you telling me Alex that there aren't that many places in the world where if you are <laughs> English German it's an advantage to say I'm German. I know. I know where that's going. Yeah, I knew what you were going to say. Yeah, there, there were. <laughs> there's not many places I've lived where people were more interested in my German half. Yeah, exactly. But I, it, one of those places is, and I think certainly was, Latin America as a whole in 1970. Yes. Yeah. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that. One is that uh, the English were the, were, were the old bosses. You know, so you don't like them anyway. You don't yeah. like them. You know, you're, you're, you're going to define yourself against them. Uh, there's also, as unfortunately has surfaced very, very strongly in, in Brazil recent years, there, there, is, there is an undercurrent of fascism yeah. in, in Latin America as a whole. There was always sympathy for, for it. And you see that very clearly in, 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 in Brazil at the moment. And there's specifically what happened to South America in the 66 World Cup, where there is the view, and I think probably a justified view, that they all got stitched up by a FIFA that, yeah. had, a, that had an English, that had an English uh, president. And th there's a lot of discontent. It's the moment after which Havelange, the Brazilian, thinks I can put together an anti-British anti coalition and become, become president of, of, of FIFA. You throw in the fact that Ramsey, Alf Ramsey was the England coach, is the worst diplomat imaginable. Um, you know, the, the yeah. famous thing about Ramsey um, being greeted at Glasgow airport, you know, welcome to Scotland, Mr. Ramsey. You must be fucking joking. <laughs> and he liked the Scots much, much better than he liked the, the Latin Americans. He just, I think he hated them, you know? So he was yeah. a terrible, and so they, they'd managed to turn the whole environment against them. But and, also uh, a very specific incident, Tim, was in uh, the England-Argentina game in 66. Yeah. The referee was German. That's it. In a dizzying combination of facts. Uh, well, while, meanwhile, while Germany played Uruguay, and Uruguay have two cents off, the yeah. referee is English. So it, and, it, and you it, now have in 1970 in England, Germany, an Argentine referee. Argentine, re Argentine yeah. referee. So uh, I think England are, are a better side. Yeah. And I, it, it, it amazes me how non-controversial in the aftermath of the game the refereeing was. Uh, it, I think it shows how it, it's a world before VAR was feasible. You know, what, yes. one of the things that made VAR feasible was people moaning about the referees so much. I think, but back then, maybe, I don't know, I don't know, maybe that happened left. But anyway, so for me, it's the 72 game where definitively we were overtaken by them. <laughs> you. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and what, what I think confirms that is that the German conception before the game of the team, before the game in 72, was that they were, they were going to lose. Because I think they knew that the breaks had gone their way in 70 and they kind of expected England to, to, to be better than them in 72. Yeah. And it was a surprise even, I think, to the German side there how, how superior they were in 72. Of course, the game started that way. Um, England took the lead and looked superior. Uh, and this is where I think we have to involve some other factors, not just the refereeing, but also the venue of the game and uh, the weather, the time of the game preparation um one really interesting parallel i think is this fact that the fact that the game was in leon this small stadium uh co compared to guadalajara where england had played their group games and um in this in this small ground in leon germany had already played four games i think or three games three yeah this was their fourth and so they'd made a home of it and as you said they were quite popular anyway and certainly more popular than England and so it was a home game as it were and it it reminds me a bit of how popular um, Germany made themselves at the Brazil World Cup in 2014 yeah. Yeah. especially their base was in Bahia wasn't it That's it. and so they had a lot of um, and they wore those flamingo colours in their in their away shirt and it, I, I see a bit of a parallel there and as you said with Alf Ramsey in England the preparation couldn't have been worse with the way they were handling media locals 
how they had a long bus journey up there to altitude the day before no time to acclimatize so um lots of factors although i accept that the refereeing is a big one <laughs> It only was, it was a very good England side. I mean, the, the, the debate goes on about whether 70 was better than 66. Uh, I think there are, there are, fav there, there are, I think there are more factors in favour of them being better. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're a very confident side and they know, they know that they're really good. There is a, there's a swagger of real confidence, maybe exemplified, perhaps it went over to arrogance, you know, with the, when it's 2-0, yeah, Al Alan Ball going around saying Auf Wiedersehen to, to, to the Germans, <laughs> you know. But they were, and Brazil were scared of them. Yeah. Uh, that, that it would have been a, a fantastic game where, admittedly, if you swap the two goalkeepers around, the England-Brazil game, if you swap the two goalkeepers around, Brazil would have, would have, won, would have won easily. So on, on the note of the goalkeeper, um, you said... Uh, if had Banks been fit, the result would have been different. Notably, I have no opinion on that yet, but notably my predecessor, David Downing, who wrote the last book on this rivalry 20 years ago, um, he said that uh, that's a foolish uh, conclusion to make because um, Gordon Banks also made the odd error. Um, Manetti made lots of good saves. I don't know where he, I stand on that. Make, but I thought, he does I thought make it was some good saves in, in this game as well. Yeah, there are yeah. some good saves from, from Bonetti. But I don't ever remember Banks letting in a goal like the first German yeah. goal, which is the one that changes the game. Because England have control of the game. Uh, and one of the things that, that Ramsey has really worked on from, six, from after 66 is the attacking fullbacks. And it's an England side, I think, that are years ahead of its time. And that they have Cafu and Roberto Carlos years and years earlier. Yes. With Keith Newton and, and, and Terry Cooper. And Keith Newton at right back, he sets up both goals and he comes close to scoring and he sets up other chances. He never played for England again. It, it's almost like the death of an idea for, for, for England, that, that, the idea of, of, of the, attacking, the attacking fullback. Um, and because they had those fullbacks working the entire flank, it enabled them to be more compact in midfield, which helped them keep the ball so well. When it's the striking thing from the Brazil game and a lot of this Germany game, how well England are able to, to keep the ball, because that, that isn't one thing you, you think about when you think of the, the historical identity of, 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 of the English team. But there are one or two problems as well, I think. And, and one is that the system, the tactical system, the, the 4 4 2 that Ramsey has developed. It's a platform for Bobby Charlton. Yes. And you can clearly see in the last two, this is the last game he plays for England. In the last two years, the goals drop off. He doesn't offer the same threat to the goal that he did. So in that sense, England are not as good as they were in 66. And there's also the fact that this World Cup is being played in very difficult conditions for, for European sides. Right. It's very hard for those fullbacks to keep doing it, keep doing it. I was, it, I was going to say when, minutes, when when you were extolling the uh, when you were extolling the virtues of the fullbacks, I was thinking wasn't wasn't that ultimately the undoing of exactly. England because exactly. of the midday heat? So uh, the game was played at twelve o'clock in Mexico, and all the quarterfinals were played at the same time, same, yeah. noon on this Saturday. Do you know why that was? Because mad right. dogs and Englishmen um, yeah. <laughs> go out in the noonday sun. Well, this is the first one that's been broadcast around the world. And 66, they had some TV deal. They had some TV deals, but this is the first one hmm. that's a TV event. But they haven't really yet worked out yeah. that they can sell the same thing four times. Seems crazy you know? now, yeah. 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 And that's of the way course. it always used to be. I mean, the, 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 the semi-finals used to be played at exactly the same time. Yeah. So in, in, in 62, for example, um, you get one semi-final of Brazil and Chile. The other semi-final is Czechoslovakia, and I can't remember who. And there aren't many people in the stadium for that one, because it's in Chile. And any the people who are in the stadium have got their radios clued in, in, into the Chile game. You know, mm. It's just the way that things were done. People hadn't really worked out TV scheduling. You know, the, the reason that we convene for the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast is to look at an iconic game and to try and, well, revisit it, but also revisit the circumstances around it socially, politically, yeah. and also musically. This game, the reason that we're looking at the England uh, versus uh, uh, 
uh, West Germany, it was West Germany in those days, obviously, sure. um, game uh, from 1970, 14th of June 1970, is because we're paying tribute to Gerd Müller, the, the great uh, German centre forward who won the game recently. Well, won the game, but for a lot of the game, didn't really feature, did he? Yeah, we've not even mentioned him. Thank, thank you, Don, for uh, reminding us. Yeah. Um, um, for a moment, you think it's Franz Beckenbauer's game rather mm. than Gerd Müller's. What, what, what was important? Well, he, he's about... freed a little bit. See, here we come to the substitutions mm. because they, they are they are frightened of Bobby Charlton, and Beckenbauer marks Bobby Charlton, and Bobby Charlton is substituted, and that 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 free. I'm Colin Bell who comes on makes an impact, but psychologically that seems to free Beckenbauer. And the German players, by the way, have said in interviews that when Charlton went off, they looked at each other and thought, this is brilliant. <laughs> they couldn't <laughs> believe their luck. <laughs> so that, that's one substitution which has psychologically tipped the balance to the Germans. And Ramsey didn't know substitutions. This is the yeah. first time you can have them yeah. in a World Cup. And he didn't know how to do them. And he made a mess of both of them. The other one, He's seeing that because what it, one thing that Germany were very, very good at was wingers that they had for years and years and years that they had, they had great wingers and they start off this game with two. And in the second half, they bring on another one. They, they bring on Grabowski. Yeah. And he's giving Terry Cooper a really, really torrid time, you know, because Terry Cooper has been up and back, up and back, up and back. So Ramsey is the other substitution. He throws on Norman Hunter left-footed but no, I don't think Hunter really knows what where, where to go what to do you know he's the idea I think is that he's going to help Terry Cooper and be like a, a second left back but he, he just seems to get lost it's, it's a substitution that, 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 that makes no impact I don't think Ram, I don't, don't think Ramsey had any idea of how to do his substitutions so Grabowski is still able to get one-on-one -on -one with Cooper and still able to do his stuff and you get the ball into the penalty area and that stocky little man does the rest Absolutely. I mean, I think um, very well worth noting Hugh McIlvenny in the uh, in his piece before the game uh, said that um, I've, I've got it here. If I can quote it to you, it's wonderful choice of words. But he says, um, "Any success the Germans enjoy tomorrow will be inseparable from their use of the conventional wingers." Ramsey has scorned for so long. So he predicts the day prior to the game that the, the wingers can make a difference and laments the fact that Ramsey doesn't want to use them. And then that final goal in extra time is made by both the wingers, isn't it? Grabowski and Lure. Um, on That's the, the beauty of the sides. deep cross, isn't it? So it, it really came true. Um, but had that had this is this is one of the things of of analysing games. Had the first goal not gone in, yeah. You know, had Charlton not been substituted and had had you know Banks played and so on, then if me Ramsey, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Ramsey could have argued. Look, my attacking fullbacks won the game. Yeah. Apologies. So, um, like I was saying. This is somebody who has got form. Everybody knows what he can do. And yet there's a couple of times is, during is this he game. known before the World Cup? Is he is he is he well known? Outside Germany? Yeah. Um, it, it's before Bayern Munich become a continental force. They have won one European title with him, the Cup Winners Cup. The Cup Winners um, Cup, yeah. Against Rangers, I think. Um but on the international stage, this is when he becomes a megastar, yeah. But, of course, by the time of this game, you could argue he already is because he scored seven goals in the group stage. In the group, yeah. 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 So they should know him. There's a couple of times when you see him wandering around in the penalty area, you know, looking for scraps, as it were, <laughs> and you think, well, what's going on? Do, does the England defence not know that this is the danger man here? Yeah, I mean, I think um, that is exactly what we need to talk about when we're talking about when we're remembering Gerd Muller is the instinct for a goal, isn't it? Um, he, he used to say that he could smell it. He could smell the opportunity um, and, and could, could see the gap before it, before it was there. And he also said that if you don't have that talent, uh, you, you will never have it. There's no way of developing it. He just had it. 
he was a very modest and humble man and he he saw his talent as just innate yeah, he comes across as a gentleman on the pitch mm. as well, by the way, uh, which is a strange thing to say about a centre forward because they're supposed to be mm. hungry and everything. But like you say, it's an innate sense of being yeah. hungry, maybe yeah. it doesn't display itself. So England go up 2 0. So it's 2 0 to England. Somehow Germany claw it back, um, not least thanks to Franz Beckerbein. Is it Sia who's called the second Uwe, goal? Uwe Seeler, who's the big Uwe name. You know, he, he's been in the World Cup since 58. So but, Uwe, Uwe Seeler is one of the, 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 one big of the greatest headed goals there ever was. Well, the weird thing is, I'm not sure if he knows where it's going. <laughs> See? He kind of like, oops, OK. I, I would argue that the English have a history of uh, thinking that goals against them are inadvertent. <laughs> Well, I was wearing my Nigerian hat then, but thank you for that. Uh, but so that goal apart, the game goes into extra time after 90 minutes. What happens then? Tim? Take it away. Take it away. Well, as far as I understand it, I, I also haven't got access to the full game uh, yet. Um, but as far as I understand it, England are tiring terribly. Um, and the Germans are emboldened by the fact that they've forced extra time, just as they did uh, four years previously. Yeah, and, some, uh, have, some have made the much of the contrast between the extra times, where at 66, yeah. Ramsey says, look at them, look at the Germans, they're all on the floor, look at them. You've beaten them once, now go out and beat them again. Couldn't say that in 70, because yeah. <laughs> it wasn't true. I think one thing I'd like to say on uh, to make this more about Gerd Muller as well is that he was born in 1945, just as the war ended. And he would have seen uh, as a nine-year-old, which is kind of the time when I, the, the first clearest memories of football happened for me also, he would have seen the uh, 1954, or he would have heard it perhaps on the radio, the 1954 World Cup final when Germany came back against the great Hungarians to win in the uh, miracle of Bern. And I, I think there's, for that generation of German players, there, that, was, that instilled in them the idea that you're never beaten. And then um, he'd also seen, of course, the extra time in 66. And there's the extra time here. And then, of course, three days later, they play Italy and again go the distance in extra time in what was then called the match of the century, the semi-final against Italy. But in, in, Ger in, in Germany, this game was actually called uh, Jahrhundertspiel, which means match of the century. And then three days later, it was bested <laughs> by the defeat to Italy, sadly. The, the side immediately afterwards, by 72, you have Paul Breitner and Gunter Netzer, who, you know, just to look at them, you yeah. see the German counterculture. Yeah. I is there any of that? in this team because surely one of the big differences between the two countries is that the germ the, the post-war german youth were forced if you like to to forge an identity of themselves for themselves based on an acknowledgement of historical crimes whereas english youth not that there aren't historical crimes there are yeah. plenty of them you know sure. I've never had that, that, that obligation. Can you, in this 1970s side, can, can you see them as, as culturally different from German sides of, of, you know, of a few years before? Because this is the generation that has no connection with, with the, uh, the Nazi regime. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I think I feel an affinity for the, for the likes of Gerd Muller because they're born at the time when my father's born, uh, end of the 40s, mid 40s, end of the 40s. And um, um, I think if you're talking about um, the 70 team, they go on with Muller now in the, in the side alongside Beckenbauer and Zetmeyer, the great goalkeeper. They go on in 72 to win the Euros. And I think in, within Germany, that's still seen as the greatest team that's ever represented mm. the country, if it slightly shades 54 and 90. So 
um, I think there's a great affinity for that side in, in terms of how different they are to what came before. I can't say so much really, but um, what strikes me about Muller is, is that Beckenbauer was always the star. Beckenbauer to this day is seen by most as the greatest football figure because of course he also won the World Cup as manager in 90. But to a man, all of these people, when they're talking about the time, they say that Muller was the most important, even if he wasn't the best player or the most... Um, I mean, I think he is technically gifted, so I wouldn't say he wasn't the most technically gifted. But I think you know what I mean, that Beckenbauer was seen as an all, all round talent. Um, but to a man, they all say that Muller was the most important. What's the relationship between them? It was, it was excellent, especially around, uh, because of the Bayern connection and the Bayern nucleus. So I think one thing that I want to highlight, because we hear about it less in England with the, with the tributes and the obituaries, um, lately is just how important he was to Bayern as well as to the German team. So um, he's, when he signs for Bayern um, in 1964, I think he's still um, 63. I think he's still 17 when he signs for them. And both Munich clubs come to, this, to the little market town of Nördlingen where he's from, which is on the western extremes of Bavaria and it's a little bit like I, I promise I won't make more Shakespeare references but it's a little bit like Stratford-upon-Avon it's a small town of 20,000 people and you've got these big cities of Nuremberg and, and um, Munich and his his little town is slightly closer to Nuremberg than it was to Munich so he supported Nuremberg and wanted to deep wanted desperately to play for them but they weren't in for him. So when he was scoring all these goals in the in the um, in the lower leagues for his hometown club, the two Munich clubs came to talk to his mother at the same time. And the story is variously told whether a, the representatives of 1860 talked to her first and then went to the pub across the road, and the representatives of Bayern came in next, and he signed the deal because he only saw them. Other people say that. The representatives of Bayern were there first, and then waited patiently in the uh, in the pub across the road. Also, a slight variation of the story, while 1860 made their bid, but the the, the bid had already been informally agreed. Uh, it's a strange but, decision, perhaps, because 1860, when the Bundesliga starts, which is yeah, around this time, so the, yeah, exactly. 1860 are the Bundesliga club. I wanted to say, uh, from from today's perspective, nobody would would uh, question that decision. But interestingly. Um, 1860 were the top side at that time and Bayern were still in the second division and he chose to join Bayern because he thought he wouldn't get a game with 1860 and also one, one thing that might be apocryphal is um, Nuremberg apparently didn't come in for him at all which was a great disappointment to him and he says had they done so he would have snapped at the chance um, but they, they apparently gave the reason that they already had two people with the same surname in their squad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Moon is a common it, surname. It is, it is a very it? common surname, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's, yeah. Um, it's great that you give this historical perspective. That's what mm. you do. You're a historian. Um, and it, interesting how football can change over the course of you know, a few years, let alone a generation or so, the Bayern Munich. Who would have thought the Bayern Munich wasn't yes. a go-to club in Germany ever? Front page of The Guardian, day after, June 15th, 1970. Mm. This is, they catch Gerd Müller in full flight with the photograph. Uh, I, I know goal. that photo. It's a wonderful photo. It's yeah. a, absolutely it's, amazing. You can yeah. see the size of his thighs on that. Brilliant. You can. Yeah. You yeah. can. You're absolutely right. And the fact that he's wearing the number 13 shirt, would you believe it? Unlucky for some, i.e. England. Um it, it, it is a great goal, though. And we haven't really talked about I the goal. Maybe, goal. yeah, we should talk about that as well. But this is the um, England... Oh, this is the front page of The Guardian. This is uh, the way that they've written it up. I'm going to do it in my best 
Tim Vickery voice as well. <laughs> Moments of defeat for England in the quarterfinals of the World Cup Championship at Leon Stadium in Mexico as Gerd Muller, number 13, scores the winning goal for West Germany. England out of World Cup. England are out of the World Cup in their quarterfinal match at Leon last night. They were beaten 3-2 after extra time by West Germany, the country they beat to win the trophy at Wembley in 1966. That game, too, went into extra time. England had a lead of two goals after 50 minutes through goals by Mullery and Peters, but West Germany fought back to equalise through Beckenbauer and Seeler. In the 18th minute of extra time, Muller gave Germany victory. There you have it. Um, I think it doesn't sum up just how fabulous this goal was, no. winning goal. Did you fancy describing it? I I think I'll leave it to Tim to describe it. I'll give you some background uh, as to why Muller might have been so good in situations such as this, which is he... I, I've, I've heard Tim over the years talk quite a lot about the importance of street football and why Brazilian footballers are so skillful because of the places in which they grew up playing. Um, and I think this applies in a way because Gerd Muller played in a small cobbled square in his town with his school friends. And one of his friends in an interview said that the uneven bounce on the cobbles made him very good at uh, in those situations where something unexpected happens. And I think that applies to this goal. And then furthermore, after school, he had a school friend who was a, uh, the son of a baker and they used to go to this bakery to play football, to play little one-on-one -on -one, uh, competitions with each other with a football. And they'd used upturned, um, I don't know what, uh, this is hard to translate from German, but sort of um, baker's bowls, large, large bowls that are described as large as a satellite dish. And they'd upturn those and try and dribble around them and play the uh, one-on-one. It was a walk, in other words. But that, that kind of size, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Remember, this is 1950s Germany. But yeah, <laughs> but, um, but yeah they dribble around them uh, inside this, uh, this bakery after it had closed for the day. And um, that's, that particular school friend said that that's how he became so adept in, um, in tight spaces. He, so he was the genius. Both those apply to this space. goal. Yeah, genius yeah. of reduced space. I've never seen anyone remotely as as good as as him in in reduced space. When the, the goal yeah. is is the value of of the deep cross, and it's the value of one winger doing the cross and the winger on the other side, knowing that that that's the moment to get close to the far post, because Grabowski teases Terry Cooper, gets in the deep cross. And I think it's Lure, is it the other the other yes. winger yeah. who 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 is beyond just beyond the far post nods it back across goal. So Muller has to has to change his position quickly because the ball's gone one way over his head and now it's coming back the other way. Uh, and so he has to get get his feet into position to launch himself for a for a high volley that that goes above. Benetti's it's almost like a religious image I think of Benetti with his with his, with his hands in the air in, in, yeah. in supplication um, it's a fabulous reduced space goal from the master I mean so many of of the Muller goals that I remember all you got to do and Jimmy Greaves used to say this all you got to do is get the ball over the line you don't yeah, have to you don't have to break the back of the net uh, I've, I've, I've heard you say that in a previous pod I think about how not all is um, not all his strikes bulge the net but that's quite funny, isn't it? Because I, I think the nickname Dare Bomber came yeah. from the ferocity of his shot initially at Bayern. So mm -hmm. it's a kind of... I mean, this is a great... It shows uh, that he was uh, capable of everything. This is a great volley, isn't it? This really flies in. And the one that that, won, that wins the World Cup four years later isn't. Yeah, yeah. It's just just beautifully placed and, you know, beautifully done on the, on the, on the spin. Muller, it, Muller, he, Muller again. He says himself so that he didn't hit that properly and it, that's a sign of his humility that <laughs> the most important goal in his life, he says he didn't hit properly and he's thankful he didn't because it might have been saved if he had. Um, where do we put him then in the annals of world football? Where does his mastery rank? As a centre forward, obviously, but all-round footballer as well. As a centre forward, he's got to be in... I, mean, I think he's in the top one. Top one. Yeah, I think I, 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 as, as I agree with... Um, yeah. I heard Tim say before he's the best ever inside the penalty area. I definitely agree with that. 
top one. I'm, I'm impressed with that. I was, I was going to go for like top five or something like that. But. Well, yeah, well, one of the great things about football is that there are so many different skills and, you know, and there are lots of positions on the field that you wouldn't play in. You know? Well, no, but, but, but there are lots of different sort of centre forward positions as well. Yeah. Like, arguably, you know, you've got like the fox in the box. He's more than that, though, isn't he? He is a fox in the box, but I think that underestimates what he can do out and around the penalty area as well as much as everything but else. There, there were plenty of games when he didn't figure very much. And yeah. I remember, because it's the first game that I watched live, the 72 one. Yeah. Uh, and, and I remember the commentator for most of the game saying, Muller, well, yeah, Muller. And then... <laughs> Back of the net, Muller. <laughs> Ooh, this, way. this is Ooh, another yeah. thing about him that I wanted to mention, which is um, I I sometimes see these clips. Uh, I watched uh, all of his uh, 10 goals in that 1970 World Cup. Golden uh, boots, obviously. Mm. obviously. Sure, yeah. yeah. There, only two people have scored more in a, in a World Cup. Um, and... All of them were from 12 yards or fewer. One of them was a penalty. All the others were from less than, less distance than that. And I sometimes wonder whether if he was playing in my, in my day and I was watching him, whether I would even like him or whether I would sort of enjoy him. I've, I've heard Tim um, mention, I think, Romario and Aguero in, in comparison to Gerd Muller. And another one, although... I'm not going to make any friends comparing a German to a Dutchman, but uh, another one that comes to mind is Ruud van Nistelrooy. Mm. And I couldn't, I couldn't stand van Nistelrooy when I was young, no, and when, no. when he was on TV. <laughs> I, I really disliked him. And that makes me wonder sometimes whether, whether I'd have appreciated or enjoyed Muller if he was playing in my time, or whether he was just, whether he was perhaps seen as a numbers man, just somebody who gets the goals. And, but that, that is his talent. But I remember I mean, he, he wasn't as good a player. He was a similar player in some ways. That's Clive Allen. That, 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 that's yeah, something, yeah, you know. Yeah. Uh, he, he got the numbers. Cross, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, I was at so many games when the crowd were, you know, Allen, you lazy so and so, <laughs> yeah. Allen this, Allen that. <laughs> Ball in the back of the net. Yeah. One Clive Allen. <laughs> you know. I was going to say that uh, comparison with uh, Van Nistelrooy, though. I, I, for me, the most uh, memorable image of Van Nistelrooy is where Martin Keogh's having a go at him. For, of course. Of yeah, course. For, yeah, yeah, feigning the injury or feigning being <laughs> roughed up. For the, and you, you can see that. Van he'd uh, he'd, he'd, hit, he'd hit the bar with a penalty. He wasn't feigning that injury. Was he'd he'd missed a penalty and, and Keogh was having a go at him. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, no, but, but Keogh was looking like that's justification for the yeah. initial uh, yeah. foul that wasn't a foul in Martin Keogh's uh, words. Absolutely. Okay, um, we, we've looked at Gerd Muller. Hopefully we've paid him a good tribute as well. Uh, he's number one in the annals of centre-forward history. Hmm. Um, in the news... He's got the numbers to point at it, hasn't he? Yeah. And the, num well, the numbers got back it. him he's up. Got it. Uh, that ain't ever going to be beaten, that record, I would have thought, in the Bundesliga, is it? 370-something goals in 450 appearances. No, I mean, Lewandowski's just beaten his single-season record, but he's not even halfway in his goals for Bayern, so... It's, yeah. it's, that's not, not going to be beaten, yeah. No. And, he, um, and he also scored more than a goal a game for Germany, so yeah. really... Fantastic. That's just remarkable. It's like, yeah. wait, hang on a second, why leave this guy out? He's scoring every single game yeah. and scoring a bit oh, more uh, as That well. reminds me, by the way, on a, on a previous pod, I heard Tim asking, wondering why he stopped yeah. playing for Germany. Did you find out the answer in the end? Someone said uh, it was someone who changed Disputes. his name by deed poll to Gert Muller, yes. uh, yes. which I think is great. You know, it's true. It's true. Um, yeah. He lives in Swindon. <laughs> it all stems from the the banquet after the the, the final in seventy four, where the families weren't weren't invited. Yeah. Is, is that your understanding? That and that if, is. If that... so, why only? Why did he take that stance and not the others? Well, exactly. I think it's uh, that is the the story told. His answer to that is that that merely uh, provoked him to take the decision that he was thinking of taking anyway for a, a half a year already. And the manager, um, Schoen, uh, wanted him not to announce it before the final. Uh, but he was already thinking of um, hanging up his boots in his international career anyway. Um, 
for two reasons, I think. One of them was uh, Barcelona came in with a bid for him in the beginning of 74, and the, the DFB, the, the German FA, um, threatened him with a suspension if he went there. And it shows what a, what a sort of simple yet principled man he was in that he, he, his quote on, to that was that he, he thought he was just representing the, the German constitution, which is that you could freely work where you want. Mm -hmm. uh, that was his comment on that. So that probably angered him in the first place with the DFB. But then the official reason that he gave was just that he'd been away for so long and had never spent time, uh, proper time with his family at home. For all these years, he, he 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 was probably exaggerating a bit, but he said he's playing a hundred hundred games a season for Bayern, plus all the Germany commitments. And he said that when he came home, his three year old um, three year old daughter, I think it was, said, um, "Oh, is the uncle there again?" Mm. So he yeah. <laughs> very does, sad. Does that, so he, he decided mean, to spend more time with them. Does that mean that because I mean, the great Charlie Watts has just left us who yes, uh, yeah. was, was an idol to me. And, and one of the things that Charlie used to say was, you know, he just liked being at home. He'd like, but what he did, a drummer, it forced him to, to go out on the road and, you know, yeah. would rather probably not have done it. In the case of, of Muller, the fact that his profession and being at the top of his profession obliged him to travel so much and so on. Mm. Do you think that's part of, of the drinking? Because I mean, he had a reputation as a massive drinker while he was playing even even while he you know and I, i've seen reports of others thinking wow he can put him away and it, right. it be, but it became a big problem later on didn't it he, he really had a battle with alcoholism and yeah. do you think part of that was that psychologically he was one of those people who just didn't want to be on the road all the time yeah i've actually well it's ironic that you put it that way because one one version of it that i've read was that his alcoholism started or became really problematic when he returned to Munich from his time. We should mention that he went off to America to play when um, the likes of Beckenbauer and Pele and George Best were also there. And he went off to play for Fort Lauderdale. But uh, one sort of obituary uh, write-up of his life that I read in German said that it was on his return to Munich when he had nothing to do that his drinking really escalated. So no, I, think, I think Bobby Moore wrote about it even from their time in the States. Yeah, maybe that's um, not talked about enough. Yeah. Mm. So in the papers, um, and this is the day after the match, uh, Monday, June the 15th, 1970, front page of The Guardian, you'll be pleased to know, Alex, that uh, West Germany features on the front page. Mm. This is a time when, in England, we're preparing for an election. Wilson yes. versus Heath, as it were, in it's, West it's Germany. The election that sends us into the European Union. Yeah, it does. It does eventually, doesn't it? Mm. Um, finally, uh, was it uh, General de Gaulle said, ah, "Okay, we, hello, we, Lizzo." No, he had to die first. Oh, he, di he died first before that, he that died was that a big year. Yeah. Block. Did, yeah. Did, did, was it the jackal that killed him? You know, the day of the no. jackal. No. Okay, which is, no, 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 the movie, not the bloke. Yes. Yeah, I was wondering if it was the film that killed him, but yeah. Anyway, um, Willy Brandt, remember mm -hmm. him huge uh, giant of West German politics. Front page, Brandt's support disappears in land elections. The West German government suffered a setback today. The political parties which formed the federal government in Bonn, the Social Democrats and Free Democrats, lost support in the election. Uh, uh, basically, that is what is going on in terms of journey. But interestingly enough, in the paper, they've got a section called Letter from Bonn, Mm -hmm. which is written by Norman Crossland. And these are the stories he takes up. Apparently six formidable ladies from North Rhine, Westphalia, called a press conference in Bonn the other day. I don't know if you want to comment on that. <laughs> I have no idea. Okay. Is, is, is this the kind of height of, of, of German social democracy, 1970? Um, I think it... I think so. Uh, I'd have to check with my father on that, but uh, I think it could be considered to be <clears throat> that the German German footballing success went hand in hand with the uh, economic prosperity that was growing. Yeah, yeah. 
So I, I have very happy memories of, of the 70s. Yeah. And the 70s is, is a decade that is continually bad mouthed economically. You know, the three-day week and yeah, in England, three-day yeah. week, of off. course. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you know, I, I think that the, the the circumstances of of my family are not that distinct from from uh, from many others. Going into the seventies, we didn't have a TV, a washing machine, sure. a fridge. You know, we didn't have we didn't have any of them, any of those things. We got those things during the seventies on some things like a phone and a uh, a seventh-hand Eastern European car didn't come until the 80s but the yeah. 70s it, it, it was a very egalitarian era it was the it was the the, the in, in english life in british life it was the most egalitarian decade which is perhaps why certain people want uh, have, have spent so long demonizing it sure. afterwards um but I, i've got doing this has just brought it back so clearly this is exactly the moment when the tv appeared in my house 1970 or, 1970 now black yeah. and white tv my dad worked for the co-op so it was rented off the co-op and i know it was now because i've got two memories of tv right at the start one is the players lining up for a game in the 70 world cup that's obviously why my dad got the tv because the world yeah. cup you know the world cup started and i can just even black and white just the magic of the images from mexico just how how beautiful how un yeah. it's almost like the moon landing you know it's this unreal quality of the light and so on and the other memory i've got from right at the start of getting a tv and it's only just clicked now because we've looked at, I've, I've looked at what was in the charts at the time i remember sitting must have been top of the pops sitting with my mum watching christy do yellow river and it's it's the it's the number two record at the moment so it's exactly that time that that uh so I, um, I think my my father-in-law, who's Brazilian, by the way, my, my wife's Brazilian, that's why I was over there. Um, my father-in-law is similar age to Tim, I think, and says also they got a TV for the 1970 World Cup. Uh, it's a key thing that popularised TV in, in, yeah. in Brazil, the, yeah. the 70 World Cup. It's a massive cultural moment for, for yeah. um, the country. But that, the, the, the 70s thing, I mean, the social democracy permeated the conservatives as, as, as well you know there, there was a there was an early attempt at, at some kind of proto thatcherite things but i mean heath was a grammar school kid who you know i think he, he preferred sitting down and meeting trade union leaders than 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 meeting the toffs i think he preferred that and when you when you read about heath going into the ec the idealism with which he talks about it mm -hmm. it's amazing to think that he was the leader of the same party that uh, that, that these days seem to uh, yeah. seem to have an Alf Ramsey attitude to foreigners. <laughs> well, I'll tell you this: um, as important as all of that is, the in English or British elections, there, there is a lot going on in Germany. And well, Harold, Harold Wilson democracy. says that reckons that this game won the election for for well, the Conservatives, and that's almost certainly um, because yeah, yeah, yeah can, he, he said it. That's almost well, certainly yeah. because Labour lost a vote with uh, Alex's mum moving to moving to Germany on yeah. the 15th. I wonder if, as she was going one way, the James Boland character from The Likely Lads was going the other. Because <laughs> yeah, uh, if you remember the plot, he'd <laughs> married a German other. girl <laughs> and uh, he, he couldn't cope with, uh, with uh, her after, after the 3-2. He just walked out, walked out and went back to Newcastle. So well, I, I did ask my mum if she has any memories of uh, this game being discussed in her household. She says her father who was uh, called Cyril, um, my English granddad, whom I've never met. He said he was only interested in the the little red ball, only in, interested in cricket. Yes, yes indeed. Uh, Probably had Germans, a test match special on at the same time. The Germans are just wild about football, but it still can't apparently attract as many people to the television set as a Durbridge who've done it, says The Guardian on this day in 1970. <laughs> in Munich, the city waterworks registered that 1,800 litres a second were used after the end of the Germany-Bulgaria match. On yeah. Sunday, 200 litres less than at the end of the Durbridge play. So we don't know what it was like in the finals. But interestingly enough about these housewives of the North Rhine. It's a good yes, please. Story. Yeah, the six yeah. ladies. Yeah. Well, it's a good little story. 
uh, described themselves as purely private housewives who on their own initiative had formed a committee to organize a feminine march on Bonn in protest against rising prices. For a modest outlay, they got plenty of publicity, albeit partly of a sniggering kind. And on the day of the demonstration, about 1,500 women descended on the town in a fleet of buses. They drove threateningly to the place they regard as the seat of the trouble, the Ministry of Economics, where in the absence in Brussels of the Minister Carl Schiller, they were received by an official. It's difficult to convince some of the demonstrators that they had not seen the minister hiding behind a curtain. And later, uh -huh. <laughs> later they marched later they marched handbags swinging which gives you a sense of the kind of coverage that these things yeah. got on the also top. the fact that it was called a feminine march of course yeah. yes yes yeah, so it was written by <laughs> norman crossland mm -hmm. later they marched handbags swinging through the town center accompanied by a band whose repertory included colonel bogey well it's going to isn't it it's going to <laughs> <laughs> or as we call it, Hitler's only got one ball. Anyway, yeah. the musical items were interspersed with loudspeaker slogans like the price of Jagverse, a spicy sausage, has gone up by 1.25 marks a kilo in the last three months. Or is it her Schiller's will to put up even the price of the pill? It looked indeed as if the housewives of the country were spontaneously up in arms. Suspicious people in the Social Democratic Party's press service decided to conduct an inquiry into the demonstration. They discovered that nearly all the members of the organising committee were members of the Christian Democratic Union. Ah, so there's politics in it after all. Isn't yeah. We got there in the end. Taxpayers Alliance. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Um, okay. Stooges and not Iggy Pop either. I couldn't possibly say, but thank you very much for saying that. Uh, no fun, no fun. It's not funny. Mungo Jerry is number one in yeah. the charts at this point in the mm. summertime. And you being a historian will know this very well, Alex. <laughs> Obviously, no, but that song has gone through, you know, a, a, a reassessment because it's no longer cool to sing that you're just been in the bar get yourself sloshed and you're just about to drive home yeah. it's no longer cool it was a great tune it was a great no, I mean I, I, must, I must I must say something on this song because I'm dreading the uh, music section of this pod I know nothing about uh, music especially at that time I'll be about as useful as when the music is in the 2010s and Tim <laughs> has to say something um, but I did look rubbish I did then look at the charts. I was delighted to see that number one was Mungo Jerry uh, in the summertime because we all know that one. So, yeah, great tune. It's a great tune, and we, we don't forget the image as well. Everybody knows Mungo Jerry. They don't know the rest of the members of the band, but they've got the lead no. guy because has got the big sideburns. Mm. I think he might be mixed heritage as well, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think he yeah. Is. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Yellow Christie, uh, sorry, Yellow River by Christie is number two, as uh, Tim's already alluded to. All Right Now by Free is at number four. This is I'm a, obsessed with this. I'm obsessed with this biggies, song. So, a yeah, I mean, big anthems. I, I love All Right Now and I hate what it spawned. Um, many would see this as kind of like proto heavy metal. The band Free, they, they are blues. They are steeped in, 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 in the blues. There's another example of this also in um, the great Peter Green with Fleetwood Mac. It's at number 10 with uh, the Green Ma uh, Manalishi, which is, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting record. It's the moment when Pete Green is starting to lose it. But Pete Green is a fascinating character as well. You know, there's, there's that kind of Bethnal Green Jewish spirituality and, and mixed in with hippie spirituality, mixed in with whatever happened to him around then that just sent and him. And that was in Germany that it happened to him, if my recollection was, yeah. reminds me. Yeah, yeah, it's correct. So another German twist. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the, the Germans, they, they with that, I mean, I'm, I'm not, not having a laugh at them, but with that kind of earnestness with which they go in for a lot of things, I think they took it very seriously. You know, and I, I think I would like to discover more about post-war German youth culture because like, and the, the Beatles, when, when the Beatles were in Hamburg, yes. uh, the influence that the existentialists had on them, not just in the look, you know, the look is the obvious, mm -hmm. the, the, the haircut is, is the obvious way, but in terms of an outlook on life as well. And the existentialists are clearly 
the kind of German cousins of, of the, the initiant mod movement in England. But being Germans, they are really hard. They're really serious about it. You mm -hmm. know? And I think that, 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 that seems to me to be true about, about a, a, a lot of the way that the Germans were interpreting youth culture, which in many cases was, come, were coming, was coming from England. Uh, and the way that they were interpreting that and taking it very seriously, and I, I think you're right. I think it was in 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 Germany that 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 Pete Green was, according to some, like kidnapped and 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 had had strange things going on with with his head. But anyway, back to all right now. Um, it's a blues song, and uh, one of the things I love about it is it, it's just so sparse. And Andy Fraser, I think it was Andy Fraser wrote it, the bass player. He doesn't play in quite a lot of it. The, the lack of ego of Andy Fraser is unbelievable because anyone who's ever been in bands, you know, that any, everyone wants to play all the time. And he sits out a lot of it. He just sits out the verse. So it's sparse. It's just guitar chords and, and, and Simon Kirk's drum, drumming. Uh, and that's all it is. And it's so sparse. And even the guitar solo, David Kossoff's guitar solo, it's sparse as well, you know, it's beautiful, it's beaut every note is kind of judged. And what came out of it, what came afterwards, influenced by it, was the heavy metal thing that firstly had no contact with the blues, really. They hadn't listened to the blues in the way that Pete Green and, and Paul Rogers and Free had listened to the blues, you know, and it, the, the shredding, you know, trying to play as many notes, uh, I think the great, there's a great phrase from Neil MacDonald who wrote, wrote on the Beatles, you know, it, it, it was like became a, a less a musical style, more a sonic contact sport. But all right now, it also has enough hippie innocence just about this meeting. You know, there she stood on the street smiling, you know, and they, 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 go, they go back to his place and, and, and they make love. There's, there's a, a hippie ideology and innocence about it. But those who came after just just made it cock rock, unbearable, you know. And in, in terms of the hippie thing, one thing that, that that's interesting, which happening right at this time, is the Oz the Oz thing, the Oz magazine, the obscenity trial. It's just about to, to get yeah. going, you know. Yeah. Oz is a is a magazine. Oz launched in Australia. They then come to England, and and uh, I think there's something. It was it was a it was a an, a, a, an issue done by school kids and he got accused of of blasphemy and it's a it's a it's a very famous trial of of, of the time of, of of social moors have you ever come across that the publishers of uh, of the oz thing Don? well i knew felix felix dennis really well i knew him he was the richest person i knew billionaire behind gq maxime and many other <clears throat> magazines famously he was the less quote unquote intelligent of the three Oz um, um, workers who, or you know founders who were on trial. The judge infamously said uh, about the other two who one of them was Australian I seem to remember um, said of the Neville, other two, I think, isn't it? Yeah, the judge said of the other two, you know, you two, you know, you're at Cambridge University. What are you doing playing around with this puerile stuff? But with Felix Dennis, <clears throat> the judge said, well, I'm not surprised at you because, you know, you're you're a numpty. And it really played with Felix Dennis's mind for the rest of his life that the judge had portrayed him as being less intelligent. So he made this decision after the Oz trials to go and become the wealthiest person he could. So he started publishing. He made his wealth, interestingly enough, just about this time because he decided to start publishing these things, these magazines about Kung Fu, which was just taking off in all the school corridors of boys' schools in any way in England. And he made his name basically selling us these posters of uh, Bruce Lee that would appear in a magazine, a little fold up magazine, you'd fold it out and it'd be Bruce Lee with his noon chuckers going like this or whatever. That's how he made his name. But then he went on and published many, many, many more magazines. He was a real fun guy. He's a real fun guy. I have very fond memories of Felix Dennis with a wicked sense of humor and a real love of life, a real bon viveur. You know, he was huge. He was a short guy, not that tall, but yeah, huge belly and everything and just 
waddled from his how, how uh, many of these hippies ended up as advertising executives i wonder I'm sure a lot Cynic, of them, somewhat cynically uh, they managed to teach the world to sing didn't they yeah. so if they can yeah. get us to sing by slurping on some sugary um <laughs> well <laughs> fizzy drink they can sell us anything sure and you've seen the end of mad men have you i don't want to I give have, it away yeah, yeah, yeah well there you go yeah. <laughs> that's where they all end up um can I give a big shout out in the charts? There's a lot to talk about. And I'm thank you for your thesis on All Right Now, which um, Professor Gross, how many marks would you give for Tim Vickery for that thesis? Wonderful. I had absolutely no idea what he was talking about, but I enjoyed it. Yeah, that's <laughs> exactly what they say. As these <laughs> academics, as they get, they get out more phrases. I don't know what you're talking about, but it was wonderful. Nice attempt. <laughs> but so, I, I would want, I would like to play up one other song uh, at number nine, uh, Back Home. Yeah, yes. Let's not forget that. Yeah. That so was that, the that classic. Is one that I know. <laughs> that is the classic of all. It kind of England launched the, 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 the tradition, didn't it? Yeah. It launched the, the it was the big one. It's, now it's the one every... with the melody that we all remember. Back home, they'll be singing about us. Back home. We love that. But uh, uh, was... Dotton, I, I want to point out from the point of view, from a neutral standpoint, I want to point out a particular line in that song. Uh oh, here we go which is back home, though they think we're the greatest, that's what we've got to prove. Ah, that's a very good line. So I think that's that says something line. about uh, the confidence. They knew. they knew what was coming. <laughs> they knew what was coming. It, look, it is, for me, and, and everybody goes on about three lines, but for my generation, this was the ultimate <laughs> yeah. England football song. Uh, three lines it. is better, but... Um, <laughs> In terms of the melody back home, there's something quaint and yep. archaic and Heath versus Wilson about <laughs> it. Um, you see, so you just remember those coins that Esso were giving away or something, don't you? you I'm I, sure I you collected the, them. I, I remember the coins at the Rainbow uh, Theatre, which was then still a cinema in Finsbury Park, that people used to throw into the fountain in the big um, entrance, the vestibule, to, to give them good luck, you know. And we used to dive in for those coins, mate. Trust me, we, were, we didn't care about the good luck. We wanted the pennies. Now, the song that I do want to give a quick shout out to is Love of the Common People by Nicky Thomas, mm. who uh, yeah. is in the charts. And there's some great tunes, you know, uh, Norman Greenbaum's Spirit of the Sky amongst them. Uh, absolutely fantastic. Weird tune by Cliff Richard, Goodbye Sam, Hello Samantha. I know what they were trying to do, but again, historically now, you think, is that a cross-dressing <laughs> song or not? Is it his version yeah, I of I think Lola? it's kind of Eurovision type thing it, isn't it, it? was That's what he got uh, into then goodbye sam hello samantha it's taken a different uh, perspective historically but love of the common people nikki thomas was one of those on trojan records was one of those uh, great uh really rock steady tunes i think you have to call them rock steady rather than reggae tunes that were huge in certainly the urban conobies uh, con conurbation conurbation that was london at that time where there was this melting point excuse me melting pot of black and white and people of non-defined ethnic heritage all living together in a melting point and now these tunes start coming out suddenly all these tunes from jamaica tiny little island but we thought that every person from the caribbean was from jamaica like trinidad and all the other islands didn't really uh, feature very much love of the common people is basically the amalgamation for me of black and white coming together in the early 70s despite all the race relations acts of 1966 i think in 1968 and all these things that there was a community of people who lived together and well it's the beginning of uh, what is going to become eventually a multicultural England side, I think, mm. as well. Living yeah, in the love in, of important the record. people. Yeah. We didn't have a clue what it was about, because I was 10 years old at this point. I got to know when Paul Young covered it years later. Oh, I'm sorry, but he did wreck it. I know Paul yeah. Young. No, 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 I agree. I, agree. Uh, it's no, horrible. No, I, I wish he hadn't done that, because I like Paul Young. I do like Paul Young, Q-tips and all of that, but he, uh, he should never have gone anywhere near that one. I could see what he was trying to do. See what he's trying to do to it. And it's a great song, but he did it the wrong way, in my view. Bridge Over Troubled Waters, it was probably in the charts for about two years at this yeah. point. It's a there's there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of country influence. A lot. Even, even, even Christie 
no, an English band like Christie, Yellow River. There's a, there's a kind of country feel to it. You know, a couple of years earlier, the Birds with Graham Parsons have, have kind of brought country into into American pop, uh, and you can see that the seed that, that they've on Glenn Campbell, not one of his best. Uh, I do like Glenn, but uh, Honey Honey Come Back, I don't don't particularly like. Even the, the Beach Boys, Cotton Fields is a is 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 a is a kind of country song. Um, so there's country's important. And another, Don't forget Mary is, Hopkin when you talk about that country in the charts of number 44 with Not yeah, Knock, who's there. Yeah, Joni Mitchell, there. Big Yellow Taxi's up there. Mm -hmm. uh, Lee Marvin, Wandering Star, you know, from the movie uh, Paint Your Wagon, was it? But That's that it. is a country song. It is, uh, yeah. I was born. And, and another thing which is just beginning to get revved up is, is progressive rock. This is the month that Emerson, Lake and Palmer form. Oh, and, and that passed me by, but yeah. Yeah, it passed me by as well. It means nothing to me. Um, but where it's perhaps most appropriate in this charts is number 12, the Moody Blues question. Now, the Moody Blues, they started in Birmingham as an R&B band. And now, you know, they're, they're, they're coming up with this... I was hoping for a Birmingham accent tonight. <laughs> yeah, now they're coming got... up with this incredibly <laughs> pompous, yeah. in, you know, dreadful rubbish, you know. But that, that that's... I suppose the doors are opening and... and there's there's because if you take if you take the, the chart back three four years pretty much everything is r&b based and if it's not r&b based it's pop based but now you you there, there's there's lots of other other traditions getting underway and one of them you've, you've identified that that kind of rock steady thing another is country another is is uh is is prog rock don't forget um, Rufus thomas do the funky chickens up there yeah. as well Arguably a blues track because he's a blues artist, but with a little bit of country about him as well, you know. Um, yeah. I think this is this chart is uh, an amalgamation of a lot of things coming together. I think it's a great it's, time to be young. It's the early stages, though, isn't it? Because it's difficult to define this chart, <clears throat> whether in relation to the football match you've been talking about, or whether it, we in relation. No, you can't to do the it in times, relation to the, to the football. The, or, the football or the match, times, or, or, yeah. or the times that you're in at this point with. Uh, England or the United Kingdom preparing to go to election and everything. This chart doesn't say uh, no. uh, Wilson versus Heath to me. It doesn't quite no. say that. But what it does say to me is that them lot at number 10 and the opposition are out of touch with the real Britain. The Green Man Alicia and Fleetwood Mac are at number 10. Well, yeah, Pete Green, <coughs> Pete Green was there, increasingly out of touch with everything, I think. Is there maybe a bit of uh, Vietnam War in there, though, with the... Uh... Credence, clear water. I don't that know much about the question. music, but mm. in terms of the more international context. I think that's a really good question. Arguably, um, Bridge Over Troubled Waters is mm. a part of that Vietnam yeah, context um, time. And also Spirit in the Sky, I, I think could, you know, make a shout for that. And Wandering Star as well, because I think it is in one of those... Uh, passages in paint your wagon where they're going through some hardship i know they're traveling they're moving on but that's where the song comes out as well i think you're right you know i didn't i didn't hear that initially when i looked down this chart i didn't hear vietnam there aren't overtly vietnam uh, songs mm. or anti-vietnam songs as they would have been in the charts there's but, one that it, it's not in the charts but it's come from just before the so Stones, let it, you know, they've, uh, just a few months before they've released, I think it's Let It Bleed. And one of the songs of Let It Bleed is Gimme Shelter. Yeah. And I, I, it's one of those songs you listen to and you think, where on earth did that yeah. come from? I mean, that still just, sounds modern, doesn't it? Yeah. It's an unbelievable yeah. song. I, I, I find them extraordinary on, on, in a number of times. I, I find, going back to 65, I find Satisfaction to be an, a, an unbelievable song. Yeah. Now, how, how do they work out? Firstly, in 1965, and secondly, at the age of 20, how do they work out the inbuilt insatisfaction of consumer culture? Yeah. You no. Know, how do they do that? I don't even think that's the strongest point. It's a strong point with satisfaction. But what I sit back, and I'm a student of blues, what I sit back and think about is how did Keith Richard come up with this reimagining of a blues riff? Yeah. This is the ultimate moment when those blues guys have been doing 
for quite yeah. a long time. You know, even in their old age, when you watch a live performance of Gimme Shelter, it's that moment when Keith Richards is allowed to come forward and get the limelight. That's the best bit, isn't it? Of course, of course. But he he recreated the blues with satisfaction. And he woke up in the middle of the night, didn't he, and jumped up and thought, let me yeah. try this riff out. He thought it was too simple. Well, I, I can imagine yeah. that. Dun, yeah, dun, 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 dun. It's like you, you learn as a kid when you're playing guitar, isn't it? It's the ultimate one. It's this period. It's just before they kind of go into like tax exile, I think, and then then their experiences are totally cut off from the experiences of of normality. That accountant, you know, something that happened with, that with, accountant did them no favors whatsoever. No. But you know. Uh, Gimme shelter. It it's just it's got it's it's finger on the pulse of yeah. Vietnam and and that, that yeah, kind I was of gonna sense say for, of paranoia. For my generation, if you're not uh, that into music, you come across those songs in films, don't you? Sort of satisfaction and apocalypse now, uh gimme shelter and good fellas. I think that's what what turned me on to those particular songs from the Stones, definitely. Well, it's a great chart. Uh, I will say it's a great chart. Thank you for bringing that Vietnam uh, context into it as well, Alex. I'm going to have to have another listen to this uh, chart uh, completely. I mean, obviously it's in there with Kentucky Rain. And when I think about it, they wouldn't have used Elvis to remind people about the Vietnam War because he was, you know, he was all uh, red, white and blue through and through. But then there is something that even politicians can't control, which is mm. the national psyche, the national sentiment at the time. If the national sentiment is, let's hark back to these old country and Western songs as a way of um, grounding ourselves in a troubled times, I can see that. It does kind of explain quite a lot in that. One context. thing that, that fascinates me about England and Germany, going just a few years uh, uh, later into the 70s, is that... You, you, you kind of see on the football field the English Mavericks. You know, there's that whole generation that come out after the 1970 World Cup, Rodney Marsh and, and, and Alan Hudson and so many others. You, and you can clearly see them as, as children of the party of the 60s. Mm -hmm. With the Germans, and we're back to that kind of earnestness of, of German youth, with... The, the corresponding figures would maybe people like Breitner and, and Netzer who are counterculture in a similar way, but they just take it so much further. There's so much is an more, excellent word to use, yeah. So much more serious. Yeah. Um, and in, 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 a, in a way that I would, I would imagine that a lot of really decent German youth in that early 70s, you know, the people who would identify with, with Breitner and Netzer end up following their earnestness into oh, being Bader Meinhof. Do you think that is, 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 that, is, that, is, is that a possible thing? Because you. You know, I, I, when, when I read or see things on the, the, the Bader Meinhof, you know, the, the, through a combination of decency, earnestness, and a desire for action, they've argued themselves in, into a place where they're, 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 they're happy to commit murder. Is that fair, or am I being unfair to a, to a generation of German youth? Um, well, I don't feel qualified to comment on that as such, but I'm, I, I love the, the adjective earnest uh, in that context. I think it's the best word that you could apply, really, because it's more than serious or disciplined, isn't it? Um, and it's also, it's not just disciplined in a conservative sense, it's on all sides of the spectrum. Mm. So earnest, I think, um, is a great word. Whether whether these, you know, your your theory that it was taken too far and ended in violence, I think is compelling. I can't, I'm, I'm not qualified to comment, but um, yeah, I think, I think that's something I'd like to investigate in my in my chapter about 1972, that particular match. Because um, I'll be writing a, a, a chapter each, more or less, on each uh, 
meaningful competitive game between mm. the two countries and their context. So I think look, looking at it in that way, it could be very interesting, yeah. And of course, Oscar Wilde would agree with you entirely. The importance of being earnest. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, very important <laughs> in this context. What a fascinating conversation we've had, uh, guys. I mean, generally, I will say this, Gerd Muller, I don't know why, but it almost brought me to tears. And uh, I yes. never wasn't yeah. fortunate enough to see this guy play football. Yeah. But I know that for us, growing up even in the wilds of London N17, um, there was always one person playing football on the street who wanted to be Gerd Muller. <laughs> I don't know why. Yeah. <laughs> There's always one person. He's, no, 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 I'll be Gerd Muller. You know, yeah. where the rest of us were going for Bobby Charles. Of course, of yeah. course. The one who doesn't um, want to run around too much. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the guy. That's, that's the me. guy. That is the guy. And the guy with he doesn't the big want to run, He doesn't want to run around too much, but he doesn't want to be in goal. Yeah. No, no, he's definitely Go not on. gaining goal. There, there yeah. are those guys when you play five aside who are not allowed to gain goal because they say so. You know, my mom did, said uh, I'm not allowed he, to gain goal. He played a few minutes in goal once. He showed oh. he showed uh, great aptitude in other areas too. And when uh, when the famous Sepp Meyer got injured at uh, in a game against Hamburg once, uh, as he was getting treatment because there were no substitutions, of course. So as he was getting treatment, Gerd Muller went in goal for a few minutes. Did not concede, uh, <laughs> but from, from behind the net as he was getting treated, Zep Meyer was barking instructions at him and telling him what to do. Uh, when's your book out? It will be out, uh, I trust, nicely in time for the, for the World Cup in Qatar, so around September next year. And remind us of the title, with or without the question mark? The title is Over the Line, a history of the England football, England Germany football rivalry. And I am uh, writing one chapter for each uh, meaningful competitive game that they have had, which is uh, 11 meetings uh, as it stands. So the, the one in 2021 at the Euros uh, constitutes another chapter. Definitely. You're going to have to keep updating this uh, book with new editions because obviously we're on a roll now. If we're they meet in Qatar, then yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we are on a roll, you know it. You've come to the end of your dominance mm -hmm. over England. You lot, I'm saying well, you. <laughs> that's the question, isn't it? I mean, another. Uh, it was another uncomfortable day for me this summer um, because I have to, live it, living in England, I have to draw the curtains and, and turn the phone off and everything. But, uh, <laughs> I, I, took, I took a good four, four or five days to get over that and then I got behind England and supported them against Denmark. And it does England. take time, doesn't it? It does, it does actually yeah. take People don't realise about this football team. I know I'm going to be over it at some point, but it will take time. But Dot and I'm a spud just like Tim, so I'm very used to it. Well, there you go, mate. Yeah, and uh, this is going to be an interesting season. When, when people say that I'm a good loser, I say I've had a lot of practice. Yeah. If I don't know how to do it by now. Exactly. You know, and it, incident, incidentally, I am a Spurs fan because of uh, Klinsman, because I moved over to London at the same time that they signed Klinsman. So. The first time, because they signed him twice, didn't they? Yeah, the first time, yeah. Right, right yeah. Before. So that was a, an so England-Germany link as well, yeah. Th that, that wasn't the time when Alan Sugar got out his shirt to wash his car with. No, that, those days were still ahead. Those, those great days were still ahead. He threw it in a bin, didn't he? It's he threw all it in fun. a bin on TV, it's, I think. It's all fun when you're a spud, mate. You. <laughs> you're not going to spunk my money all over the walls. One of the great football chairman quotes. Uh, yeah. Anyway, he's the guy, don't forget, that introduced the word bung into the um, vocabulary, mm. but also into the legal system. Mm. Because... Wow. Because in the George Graham trial, um, Alan Sugar was um, brought up to testify and he literally said the phrase, he likes a good bung. <laughs> <laughs> now we're time. talking. It was, a, it was the same as saying bunga bunga, you know, if you're Berlusconi in Italy. But it was like a word that we felt that we ought to know, but yeah. we don't know. This if is you, sure, if surely me, the bard had written that. that. Surely Shakespeare had said something like that along the way. I'd have thought it was Harry Redknapp that popularised that. If you'd have asked well, me, I'd have said Harry hey, Redknapp. Hey, listen, the West Ham fans would agree with you on that one. Let's yeah. just put that to one side <laughs> whilst we've still got a podcast. Uh, it's been great. Alexander Gross has been our guest. Uh, Tim Vickery, as always, we're reconvening next time around. But Alexander, mate, anytime you fancy coming back, you know where we are. <laughs>